Qing time. The, the Xu Jing is one of the Confucian classics, important Western Zhou classic. Why? Political content, obviously. Yao Shun and Yu, the sage kings. And to repeat, every single king or emperor from the Western Zhou until 1912 will be judged by how closely his behavior and his rule approximates that of these ideal sage kings. And if you do not approximate that, and you're more like our loser, the last Shang Pope, that means you lose the mandate of heaven. And so it's not easy to be a king um, because of what the Western Zhou set in motion at the very beginning of Chinese history. That was the Xu Jing, the political Confucian classic. Now I want to talk about the one that we're going to read today, which under letter A, it says, ritual and music. For those of you who speak Chinese or just want to be able to like actually use the terminology of the most important value concepts in Chinese, li and yue, ritual and music. These are two other foundations of the Zhou dynasty, the Western Zhou dynasty, things that start back then. Thank you. So back to the Xu Jing. Uh, my point here is to drive home to you again the, the importance of the three founders of the Zhou. Can you name them for me? What are their names? Not Yao Shun and Yu. They're legendary sage kings. And in that order, because when was the cultivated virtuous king who, had, uh, who from cowboy to polished sage king who attracted all the people but did not overthrow the Shang, his son Wu, the military king who did, and Wu's brother, the duke. Now the duke is, happens to be Confucius' hero. Confucius actually when he was growing old, there's a, and we're going to read Confucius starting next week. Actually, you're going to start reading Confucius over, over Chinese New Year, which is kind of cool if you think about the, um, the fact that you'll be reading Confucius over Chinese New Year. Um, when Confucius was growing old, he said, I'm sad, I'm growing old. I'm losing my spirit. How do I know? Because I don't dream of the Duke of Zhou anymore. I no longer dream of the Duke of Zhou. Duke of Zhou's been dead for 500 years, and Confucius so admires this man that he dreams of him. And so I hope your question is why. We can see why Wen's important. We can see why Wu's important. Why is Wu's brother, the Duke, important? The Duke is important primarily because he is credited in traditional history with establishing ritual and music as the foundation of, of, Zhou, of Chinese society. He is the one who made not law, but ritual, the way this Western Zhou kingdom was run. And that's going to be our focus today, ritual and music, Li and Yue. So now I want you to uh, open up or, or pick up two things, the handout that I gave you and something to circle, star, underline, annotate with. You remember how important music was in, uh, even in the Xu Jing, right? We have a ministry of music. <coughs> and, yeah, and harmony, this, this concept of harmony. But again, to have like officials responsible for traveling throughout the kingdom, checking the tuning of the bells and the musical instruments. It's really important that all of the lords throughout the kingdom have instruments in tune. <laughs> An odd thing. I only wish that America had a minister of music going around saying, I'm sorry, that's a little vulgar. Uh, can, you, can you like sort of elevate that a little bit? You're turning everybody into pole dancers at strip joints and gangsters on the corner. Um, but no, that was, that's now, that was then. So the Duke of Joe, credited with establishing ritual and music as the foundations of how a government runs. Do you hear how weird that is? What you have in front of you is from our second Confucian classic, which Confucius didn't write, but he did love, and quote endlessly, the Shi Jing, the Book of Songs. 
question? The Shijing, the Book of Psalms. So this is your second Confucian classic. Now notice, this is three pages. And I'm going to read it out loud, and I'm going to ask you to annotate it, to underline things. What do I want you to underline? Right on top of it, and put your name on this. Patterns? Patterns. You will hear certain patterns, repetitions. And whenever you hear repetition, obviously that's important, as, as Corey noticed, right? Harmony, right? They keep on repeating that. There's something going on with this harmony thing, right? And so in a similar way here. Um, patterns, and then I love the question under connect to Yao Shun and you. What values do we see here in this poem that are the most different from Abrahamic values? In other words, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Mormon all of the Abrahamic religions, the monotheisms. And I put parentheses, especially Christian. If it helps you to, to, to hear this more intelligently and more sensitively, picture a Christian walking into China and seeing what we're about to read going on in a temple, all right? Because what are we reading? The Shurjing is over 300 poems. And they're poems from all over the Western Zhou kingdom. And the Western Zhou kings actually sent their ministers. Remember the, the, the jade tablet thing in the Yaoshan and Yu? The jade tokens? Who can summarize and just say, yeah, that's when? Um, when you were reading the ministry, he had the people come in and they gave back the jade tablets to him and he, 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 he talked with them for I don't know how long. And he kept them for like a month and then? Yeah. Yeah, and so that in itself is an example of ritual, right? It's not just you're coming for a meeting with me, Jackson. It's not that you're just coming for a meeting with me. You are coming in order to present a ritual item, a jade token, normally worn on the belt, just suspended from the belt. Like a, like a badge is a symbolic thing that a cop wears or a, a soldier, right? So this, this ritual item you give to the king, and when the king presents it back to you, that's a ritual way of like establishing order and establishing offices and all sort of thing. It's the end of the day, Friday for me too, and so I am as sort of like as you know. I think we're all in similar mental states. Please, though, this is one of the most important and cool, regardless of whether you think it's cool, one of the most important for you to understand the rest of the semester. And in fact, it'll even take you back to the Wall Street film. The Chinese people are as much about manners as about business. This is where it comes from. The Duke of Zhou, bam, right? Which I hope you'll see. Um, I want you to separate two things from, from your minds right now. Two things in your minds. This, is, this is, doesn't really fit on here. It, it, if anything, put it back onto Western Joe Golden Age roots continued above ritual and music. Terminology. Heaven. We're not going to use the word heaven because it just invites all sorts of images of angels and people sitting on clouds with their family and Jesus and God and angels. Western heaven, right? The place you go after you die and all that sort of stuff. In China, heaven, as you read, is more accurately translated as what word? Sky. Sky. It's that, right? Let's use the Chinese word for heaven. Tian, T-I-A-N. Tian. Because that tian is the, God, is, the, is the force that the Zhou overthrew D with, right? So we go from a he god, Shangdi, to suddenly an it. Tian is not a he. Tian is an it. Tian is the sky. So separate any ideas that you have of heaven where dead people go if they're good, the opposite of hell, where they go if they're bad, and all that sort of stuff, the Christian stuff, separate that. Don't let heaven, this English translation, confuse you because you're becoming radically supernatural and the Chinese are radically natural. Second thing, in the same way, ritual. Where do you picture rituals happening? Temples, weddings. Temples, weddings. In the West, where do they happen? happen? Religious. Religious? That's not a where. Religious church. Church. Institutions. Well, you guys are more, in, or you guys are like less weird than B2. B2 said Africa. We, we are. <laughs> I'm sorry, B4. I, I said, I said in, you know, outside of, when you think of ritual, what do you think of? And, and I'm hearing Africa, voodoo. 
And it took like forever to somebody go, church, right? Hello, what happens when a priest gives you the wafer and the wine or the, the, the juice these days, right? The Eucharist, that's a ritual, right? Question. Um, when you say the West, does Africa count as part Well, no, and that's why, you know, I, I didn't necessarily phrase Africa it the West. Um, huh? Africa, no. When we say the West, we mean basically European and American, right? Because the Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman cultures. Is that a question or just a stretchy hand? Okay. I just asked you to separate the, your, your understanding of heaven, east and west. Now I want you to separate your understanding of ritual, east and west. Because ritual, as you will see in the, the, um, the Western Joe, is best understood as something like 24-7 everything you do. 24-7 conduct. From the moment you wake up to the clothes you put on, to the way that you speak, to the way that you walk, to the way that you sit, to the way that you talk to people, the way you treat people of different station, to the way that you spend your time, the way that you eat, every single thing. Here's the best illustration I can give you for this. When I found out that the Ten Commandments were only ten of six hundred commandments in the books of Moses, the laws of Moses, I was like, wow, they had six hundred? That's like insane. There are three Joe classics, not Jings. Thomas, what? Charger. Okay, sit over here and plug in somewhere over there. No, I found one over there. A hurry. Go on. I know. So Fidgety teenagers. Battery issues? No, it's a battery issue, I understand. Um, here's a simple comparison. 600 thou shalt and thou shalt nots in the Hebrew Bible. 3,300 thou shalt and thou shalt nots in the Western Job. 3,000 minor ritual rules. Not thou shalt not, but just how does a civilized person sit, interact with people, dress, everything? 3,000 minor rules and 300 major ones. The Hebrew Bible has 10 major ones, the Ten Commandments. For you to be a civilized person is for you to practice ritual properly, for you to actually, in motion, conduct yourself according to this code of conduct that is incredibly precise and incredibly wide-ranging. From your family, and here's the last point, from your family, conduct and interactions. Notice we're talking about practice here. And please put that word down, practice. Because it's doing, it's action, it's not believing. I don't believe in ritual. I do it, I practice it daily, momently. I am conscious of my every action. And if I'm not, I am looked down upon by those who are gentlemen. Um, so there are ritual rules for the family, there are ritual rules for the community, and then there are ritual rules for the government. And so every aspect and relationship in society is defined and led and, and shaped by ritual, all thanks to the Duke of Joe. Notice the one place that I, that I did not mention is ritual being important to in, 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 in China, religion. Ritual is not a religious thing, in China. It's part of it, but it's part of everything else, too. Everything else. If Wen is the cultivated who attracted people, if Wu is the, the military king who conquered the Shang Pope, the Duke is the one who invented this ritual system. And music, finally, is part of ritual. Music is part of ritual. You saw how Yao Shen and Yu, as we talked about. So, now, let us read. I am going to read it out loud. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to Think about, if you are a dancer, if you are an artist, if you are a writer, if you are a photographer, if you're a filmmaker, if you're a musician, this is from a book of songs. If heaven sees with the eyes and hears with the ears of the people, you're hearing 3,000 years ago and seeing 3,000 years ago through this poem. Why? Because this poem was what the Joe Kings said and their ritual assistants said 
This is the script from a Joe Royal ancestor ritual. It's in the Book of Songs. So you are actually hearing the words coming out of my mouth, reading them coming off of this page, that actually filled the air in the Duke of Joe and King Wu, their brothers, about four generations after, in the Royal Joe Ancestor Temple, and you're going to see images of what Joe Royal Ancestors look like. So let us listen, let us mark, because the questions are, and notice this isn't a temple, so this is an ancestor, the closest thing to religion you're going to get to in China. This is uh, an ancestor temple of the king himself and the king's family. So the question is, first of all, here's the fun way to ask the question. Culture, would you enjoy going to a church like this? That's the fun way to ask this question, because this is a temple service. Would you enjoy churches like this? That's the fun way to ask this question. The more uh, intellectual way, what values do we see here that are most different from Abrahamic ones. If a Christian missionary were, were to walk up and say, oh, a temple, I'm going to go and see what the religion of these Chinese people is like. In what, in what ways would the Christian missionary most strongly react and have issues? All right, here we go. I'm going to start with main function of bells. Underneath my little introductory italicized part. All right, so the mood entirely ruined by two interruptions when I'm trying to set up the fact that you are hearing and if you are, if you can like actually try to visualize what you're going to see, this is an astonishing thing. And I invite you to consider dancing this, performing this, dramatizing this or whatever for your final exam. I told you, your final exam is going to be project based. So it doesn't get any better than this. Consider it. Bells loom large. I'm reading main functions of bells. Bells loom large among the bronze objects. This is not the poem itself. This is an academic scholar of music, believe it or not. So bells, bronze bells. They loom large among the bronze objects cast during the Shang and Zhou dynasties. There's a lot, he's saying, a lot of bells in our archaeology from Shang and Zhou. Bronze bells. We're finding them all over the place. The vast majority of these bells have been excavated from tombs. I like that. Hey, when I die, will you put some, some music down there in my tomb so I can listen to music as a ghost? Um, and from the earliest times, their distribution was restricted to the wealthiest. Bronze is expensive, right? So only aristocrats. A small number of specimens of bells have been found in hordes of bronze vessels that are believed to constitute the inventories of former ancestral temples of aristocratic kin groups. Kin groups, family, extended family. So notice what we have here. Bronze bells showing up in two places, tombs and family temples, ancestor temples. Both kinds of contexts, burial and temple, attest to the role of bells in ritual. Throughout the Zhou dynasty, bells served primarily in the concept context of the ancestral cult. They formed part of an orchestra that provided the musical accompaniment to ritual dances and singing. Would you like to go to this temple? Would you like to go to this church? We've got an orchestra, we've got dances, we've got singing. Such ensembles comprising string, wind, percussion, have been excavated archaeologically. The one found in the Marquis E's tomb is the most complete. The highlighted part. Glimpses of Zhou ancestral ritual may be found in the Book of Songs, the Shu Jing. Skip over my little parenthetical note to you. A collection of songs and ritual hymns of Western and early Eastern Zhou date. So here's a stanza from it. The following stanza describes the musicians and the dancers in action. So now we're hearing the words of 3,000 years ago. They strike the bells solemnly. They play their su and chin zithers, stringed instruments. The reed organs and the musical stones blend their sounds. Accompanied by them, they perform the ya and non dances. They wield their flutes without error. These performances accompanied a ceremonial feast. Would you like to go to this church? To which a kin group invited its ancestors. You got your extended family there. Let's invite our ancestors. Wait a minute, all of the families there. What do you mean invite your ancestors? Who are we inviting? Our dead family, right? So here we are all together, we living, and we're going to invite our dead relatives to come join us in the temple. These ancestors were represented in the temple by impersonators, 
Please underline that one. This is where it starts getting interesting. This is a different sure than the lower level aristocracy sure that you read about in the textbook. So the ancestors are represented by a living person who impersonates them in the temple. Apparently, ritual music served to entertain and humor the heavenly guests, the ancestors, from whom the living hope to obtain supernatural, I would quibble with that word, blessings, as is evident in the following hymn from the Shurjing of the Joe Royal House, which mentions three early Western Joe kings who may well, this is radical, who may well have been assumed to be present, their spirits having descended into impersonators. Guess which kings? Joe Dynasty. Wen Wu, and since the Duke wasn't a king, I'm sure they invited him. Uh, but <laughs> Wu Sun Chung, who was the boy that the Duke was regent for. Wen Wu and the Duke, I'm sorry, Wen Wu and, and Wu Sun Chung, are imagined or hoped or believed to be present in this impersonator. Now, I hope you have, what, what question should you have at this point? Are they, like, normal? Are, is who normal? I don't understand your question. Like, how could you believe that your ancestors came back to life in the form of a... Hello, if, if you're a Christian, you believe that your ancestors are alive in, in heaven right now with God, and you're going to go there and join them afterwards. So what's so weird about believing that your ancestors are just doing a different thing? I'm not a Christian. I know, but, but even if you're not a Christian, you can understand that people do have beliefs about an afterlife, and they, they picture all... Hello, anything's possible in the afterlife if you're not in a body. <laughs> We all know what happens to the body, right? Food for worms. Yes? Um, the question, um, when it asks, like, when it says that your ancestors are uh, going to impersonate us, um, and then it says that the three kings, is it the three kings into every, or is it uh, this, like, how are Do, uh, Are there three impersonators? No, is it, um, for each family there's their own ancestors, not the, not the Zhao kings, right? This is, uh, yes. Well, what, this so if you, were, if you were a lord in one of those warring states, you would have your own kin temple, ancestral temple for your family and your line, yes. And if you were even a, a mid-level or lower-level aristocrat, you would have your family temple and your, for your ancestors. And so this thing would cascade down the social levels, even down to the village level, but they would not have the splendor that only money can buy in their ancestral temples. Yes? Do so, so like, um, people who are presumably going to a transfer, they just have I want to back up and say, who is the impersonator? Is the impersonator an actor? Okay, let's, let's stay tuned. I want you to, I, who do you think the impersonator would be? Any guesses? Priest. Priest, okay, that's a good guess. Anybody else have any? No wrong answers here. Jackson? Family member. Family member, okay. Anybody else? Which, which family member? Uh, someone else close to the deceased. Somebody who's close, who's close to the deceased. This, okay, so stay tuned. This is... The, this is one of the high points of my year because I know this thing. And I, I eight times now and I still love it. Here we go. Terrifying and strong is King Wu. Is it not strong, his passion? Greatly present are Kings Chung and Kong. Tian on high made them sovereign. From, ta from the time of their achievements and peacefulness, we living kings, have extensively held on to the four quarters. We still have the mandate, we still rule, since the time of their achievements. Clear-sighted is their splendor. Bells and drums. Now, please visualize, let yourself see and hear. Bells and drums sound magnificently. Huang, huang, there's onomatopoeia there. Musical stones and flutes chime in. Musical stones and flutes chime in. Jiang Jiang. The former kings send down blessings that are abundant. They send down blessings that are great. Their awe-inspiring demeanor is grand. They are drunk, the ancestors. They are full. Blessings and happiness come again and again. Like the Shurjing poems, we're switching now to another text that tells us about these rituals. 
the Western Zhou bronze inscriptions, including inscriptions on those bronze bells, show a strong concern with making the ancestral spirits happy. Reading through the text inscribed on an important Western Zhou bell, the first, Xing Yong Zhong, which is translated in full below, we may imagine ourselves at the scene of a sacrifice where the bell music has attracted the spirits to descend from heaven. Bells were to be used so as to please, bells were to, to be used, quote, so as to please and make exalted, which means make high, to please and make exalted the ancestral spirits as they were arriving in the temple and so as to let the accomplished men of the former generations, the dead, rejoice. In return for a successful performance, dancing, singing, ritual, music, in return for a successful form, uh, eating, in return for a successful performance, the descendants expected blessings and enduring prosperity. Expectations communicated to their heavenly visitors by means of a carefully worded prayer message during the ceremony. Much of the first bronze inscription from this Zhou Dynasty bell reads like such a text. Quote, this is our request for blessings from you because of the success of our ritual. Richly and abundantly forever let me enjoy at ease ever more ample and diverse good fortune. May you broadly open up my awareness helping me to obtain an eternal life mandate. May you personally bestow upon me that multicolored good fortune of yours. I love the multicolored good fortune. May I live for 10,000 years. Let me point to you the, the, the 10,000. It rained 40 days and 40 nights in the Hebrew Bible, 40, Moses 40 years in the desert. In China, 10,000 this, 10,000 that. It just means a whole lot, right? So 10,000 years, don't take it literally. This later we'll come to Taoism, which talks about the 10,000 things, right? It, it's not literal. It just means like a whole bunch. <laughs> the ancestors, in turn, replied through an oracle. O209, back to the Shijing, the Book of Songs, excerpted below, describes such an exchange of messages. A priest... You should be saying priest. I thought there were no priests. These are ritual specialist guys. These are the, the priest is a poor word. This is a music scholar, not as good on their Chinese stuff as they should be. A ritual specialist. The officiating invocator. What is to invoke? To call. To call, to come, to invoke. The officiating invocator, this ritual specialist, had a pivotal role in this process of communication between ancestors and family. Bells and drums indicated crucial points of the sequence. First, the setting. Here's the setting of the ancestor ritual now. The visitors and guests offer toasts and pledges to each other. The ceremonies are entirely according to rule. The laughter and talk are entirely to the point. That's the point of this, the laughter and the talk. There follows the offering of the ritual message. This is that officiating priest now, speaking, invoking the ancestors. The divine protectors have arrived. May they bestow on us increased felicity, increased happiness. May we be rewarded with longevity of 10,000 years. We are very respectful. Our rules and rites, our rules and rituals, have no error. The officiating invocator offers the announcement. He goes and presents it to the pious descendant. The pious descendant would be the living king, right? Who is calling his dead ancestor kings to come. Question mark, or could the pious descendant be the impersonator? See, this is the funny thing about the Western Joe, as you read, except we can't talk about it. The funny thing about the Western Joe, because Corey's here. The funny thing about the Western, who hasn't taken his quiz? The funny thing about the Western Joe is that um, all we have is texts that are not particularly easy to, they, they don't like fill in a lot of details. Anyway, 
So the, the pious descendant, maybe, what do you think? Is it the impersonator? Or is it the, the, the king? Keep that question in your head. Okay, so the spirit replies. This is the voice of the dead. Fragrant, fragrant is the pious sacrifice. The spirits enjoy the wine and food. The oracle predicts for you a hundred blessings. According to the proper quantities, according to the proper rules, you have brought sacrificial grain, you have brought millet, millet's a grain, picture wheat, you have brought baskets, you have arranged them. We will forever give you the utmost blessings, ten thousand fold, myriad fold. Immediately after, so there's kind of the climax. I think it's the impersonator speaking because who's, who's speaking for the gods, right? This is a script. You go to Catholic Church, your priest has certain words that he says, and they're said in every service the same exact way. It's liturgy, in the same way this is like liturgy. <clears throat> Immediately afterward, the ritual draws to a close. The ceremonies are now completed. The bells and drums have given their signal. The pious descendant goes to his place. The officiating invocator, the ritual specialist, makes his announcement. What's the announcement? The spirits are all drunk. A clue here about who this is. Uh, the august impersonator then rises. So the officiating invocator is a different person. The august impersonator then rises. The drums and bells escort away the impersonator. The divine protectors, the ancestors, then leave the temple. So the impersonator rises, is led out of the ancestral temple, and the ancestors leave with him because the ancestors possess this impersonator. Now let's pause. What is the state of the impersonator at this point in the ritual? What's the state of the impersonator? Huh? Thank you, drunk, right? What have we seen here? We have seen a family feast. Picture Thanksgiving for those of you whose Thanksgivings turn into Super Bowl or you know NFL uh, playoff games or college bowl games and beer and food and everybody's drunk by the end, right, on Thanksgiving. It's a big family, let's get drunk and have a good time. You know who the impersonator is? The king's son. So Jackson, you were on the right track. The son of the king, often, frequently, 10 years old, 12 years old, four years old, 14 years old, being, getting not only drunk, but drunk surrounded by dancers in silk, orchestras of incredible bronze bells, singers, the smell of food, the smell of incense, and dad putting him in the seat of honor, dad the king, the son of heaven, treating him like King Wen, like King Wu, like the most honored thing there is. And that kid begins the, the, the ritual sober. And he's just like, this is very, very, this is like being in church at this point, very solemn, right? Very awesome, right? You, you, everything according to rule. You don't do anything wrong here, and you don't like slouch, and you don't smack your gum with your mouth open, and you know, um, you don't giggle, right? This is a very solemn ritual to the ancestors. You're trying to attract them here. But by the end of it, he's bloody drunk, and Dad made him drunk. Let's read on to the end. Such then, at the end of the poem section on page three, such then was the basic dynamic of Joe ancestral ritual. Humans offered food and performances in exchange for blessings and assistance. In a transaction paralleled and complemented by an exchange of verbal messages, the sustaining role of music can hardly be exaggerated. Ritual and music. This last bit is really fun. Banquets and other rituals. Following the ancestral sacrifice, in which every word and movement was minutely regulated, there's that ritual practice 24-7, 3,300 rules for how to 
move, talk, everything, in which every word and movement was minutely regulated. A feast took place in the temple. So the kid's gone now. He's probably throwing up somewhere. Um, <laughs> seriously, right? And they're very ritually, right? They probably got people to help him throw up very ritually and properly because he drank too much and he's 10 and he's like, uh, But in any case, the adults, just the men, as we read, a feast took place in the temple, an occasion for the assembled male family members to become roaring drunk. Shurging 0209 indicates that here too, bells and other instruments provided musical accompaniment. The Joe Lee, the Joe Book of Rites, though a far less reliable source than the Shurging on the blah 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 on the customs of the early Joe because it was much later, and it claims to be like a, a, an accurate record of the Western Joe, it's much later, hundreds of years later. Um, stresses the near identity of the ritual sequences of royal sacrifices, oh here King Wu, royal sacrifices, and the banquets, roaring drunk male parties, and specifies that the same feasting music, Yanyue, was to be performed at both occasions. Shu Jing poems also mention bells in the context of weddings. So where else do we see ritual besides the temple? Again, separate this out. Weddings, ritual archery contests, those of you who are into Zen, think Zen is cool, Japan is cool, notice ritual archery from the Western Zhou Dynasty. Zen comes from China. It's called Chan in China, Chan Buddhism, Tang Dynasty stuff. The Japanese came and took it back to Japan and called it Zen. China's been Zen for twice as long as Japan, um, as we see here, ritual archery. Right? Uh, entertainment of visitors. Ceremonies at ritual structures outside of the royal palace. Scenes of such ceremonial activity are depicted on some early Warring States period bronzes with figurative decoration. The bronzes have images on them, right? Graphics. You've got a rubbing of one. I want you to look at it. That's why I actually included it in this little reading. Look at it. Can you see the bells? There's a lot to see here. Where are the bells? Top or bottom band? bottom band. So they're on their knees and you see them with their mallets like banging the bells from this massive um, suspended bell structure. Figure 15, the detail of a who vessel shows bells and chime stones aligned on a single rack below the bottom band, below a temple building atop an elevated platform. So what is that telling us? The picture above, the band above, that's a temple. And so that's showing us an image of what goes on inside the temples. And what do we see? In the temple, humans are humans in ceremonial robes have assembled for a ritual. From who vessels displayed on an altar, attendants ladle wine into drinking cups while musicians perform in the courtyard. Can you see the wine being poured into cups? Can you see? What do you see there? You see what? The wine jar. The wine jar? And it looks like some ladling's going on. Anything strike you as weird? A few things strike me as weird. The animal in the back? Yeah, like there's an animal mask. Uh, who, right, and so this is kind of the mystery. And remember, like Joe, Joe bronzes, they always have like wild animals, not domesticated ones. The, the Chinese have always been into wild animals. So, I don't know. Anyway. <coughs> Huh? I, uh, yeah, who knows? I don't know. Um, so, okay, at this point, I want for the remain. Well, I want for three minutes you to actually answer the question underneath that. What values do we see that are most different? I want you to write that in your blog right now, and you can open it up, solitaire boy, and you can write it in your blog. Don't poop out. I'm going to read this. This is like. Identify it. Get your head around this. What values do we see in these rituals? What values do the kings represent that would most freak out a Christian if a Christian were to show up? <laughs>